Guatemala, everyone. Guatemala, everyone. Could you please find your seats? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's not on. Sorry. Can you hear me? I don't think so. No, no it's still not on. I'll just wait for everyone um, to be seated. Thank you very much. I'm just here as the housekeeper. My name is Cynthia Rowan. I'm a Biragaba woman and my grandmother's country is the with some days. You're all supposed to go, oh. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like you to remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones, either to silent or off. Most of you may know that the toilets are to my left, your right, um, and it's also the place you need to run to if there's an emergency exit because the stairwell is there for us to um, escape. The third point I'd like to make is this is a um, live stream Zoom. The camera is here and it's got a very sensitive microphone. So the people that are sitting on this side of the room, you have to be very quiet um, because it'll pick up the sounds. Um, as you would have noticed, we have a photographer going around today. There's notices on the wall. Um, if you're very much against your photograph being taken, could you please go and speak to Emma, who's standing up there? And when we have the Q&A after um, the presentation by um, Dr Jackie Huggins, um, there'll be a roving microphone for questions. And could you wait for the microphone is brought to you and for you to speak into so we need to have it heard so those that are watching the live stream can hear the question that Jackie will be responding to. Now, I'll invite Jane Seolan. Um, to give us acknowledgement of country. Good morning. I'm a visitor to country here. My cultural connections are with far north Queensland. My mother's grandfather, Wukurukuba. My mother's mother is a uh, Irukandji group. Irukandji is one of the five Jabagai language speaking groups of far north Queensland, north of Cairns from the Barren River. So it's my honour and privilege this morning to acknowledge Turuba, Yagara peoples, on whose country we are meeting. I acknowledge and pay respects to elders past and present. This morning I also acknowledge our elders our knowledge keepers who are here with us this morning and thank you for coming. My pay respects to all elders in our nation. I pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are meeting this morning. And thank you for coming to country. For those of you who don't know, um, this used to be a theological college before it was an ACU university. Prior to that, it was farming country, uh, uh, Beehive Hill it was called, but originally it was Aboriginal land. It was an Aboriginal meeting place, place of learning, place of culture, place of ceremony, place of dance. And we remember that as we walk on country this morning. We walk in their footsteps and remember that we walk in Aboriginal country wherever we are in this country. So I acknowledge country and I welcome you to ICU. Thank you. Now I invite Archbishop Mark to the podium to welcome our esteemed speaker today.
Thank you, Cynthia. And I join Jane in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather. And I pay my deepest respects to their elders past and present. And I commit the church in this part of the world to follow with our Indigenous brothers and sisters the path of reconciliation in the power of the gospel. I also acknowledge and thank ACU for their hospitality here today. It's a thoroughly worthy occasion for which to offer hospitality. The Laurel Blow Speaker Series. Laurel Blow was in one way, in one sense, uh, not, not a famous figure at all, but in another sense she was an extraordinarily significant figure and that's why we named this speaker series after her. She was a Bachelor Nation woman, came from what we call Fraser Island but which our First Nations peoples refer to as Kagari, I think. And she was the first Aboriginal woman to be employed in the Archdiocese of Brisbane and make a really significant contribution as well. In that sense, Laurel Blow was a real trailblazer. So we remember her as we gather this morning and we give thanks for Laurel Blow and the many who like her who really did and do blaze trails. Those trails have to be blazed and it's very hard work. Now here today we welcome as our speaker this year another woman who has been for a very long time blazing trails of all kinds and I refer of course to Dr Jackie Huggins. Uh, Jackie is a Bidjara Biligabajura woman from central and north Queensland but she is um, has spread her wings in all kinds of ways. She's a writer, prolific writer. We were just talking about it beforehand and uh, I'm amazed at just how prolific Jackie is. I think she's one of these people who needs to have a manuscript on the go in order to structure her life even spiritually. <laughs> but apart from being a writer, she's an historian and, and a well-known social justice activist in the best sense of that term. So Jackie's remarkable body of work has seen her through the years, and I mean something like four decades. She doesn't look it, I know, but she, she's been around a long, long time and making an extraordinary and in some ways quite unique contribution to the wider community in Australia at this very strategic time in the wake of the Uluru Statement and all that, uh, that it opens up as possibility. Um, the Statement from the Heart speaks of truth-telling, treaty and voice and it's really the truth-telling that we focus upon here today. And Jackie is going to speak to us of um, truth-telling and in particular with reference to her own family story. And I must say I look forward very much to hearing it because I have no doubt the story is intensely personal, being her family story, but I am equally sure that it is a story that has much wider ramifications. In, in that sense it's Jackie's story, but it will be our story as well. And the telling of those stories, those truths, is fundamental to this process of reconciliation that has to be more than just a mantra. So I introduce to you a woman who has served on endless boards and inquiries and commissions in the areas of reconciliation, obviously indigenous education and employment, domestic and family violence, the prison and correction system and constitutional reform. So a woman who has made an extraordinary contribution joins us here today and I have the greatest pleasure in inviting Dr Jackie Huggins to deliver the, uh, the speech for this Laurel Blow 
speaker series. So welcome to Dr. Jackie Huggins. Thank you very much, Archbishop Mark, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Jane, for your acknowledgement of country on this beautiful piece of land that we have uh, in Brisbane. And I want to acknowledge Cynthia Rowan, who tracked me down. <laughs> uh, a few of us are laughing. You know? it's like, but Cynthia was uh, uh, very, very keen to get me to talk to you uh, when Archbishop Mark was available as well. So. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much, Cynthia, and glad, glad it's come to the 4th of August, uh, which is nice. I also want to acknowledge um, everyone in the room, my Indigenous brothers and sisters particularly, and uh, to everyone else who shares, I guess, in the journey of uh, reconciliation and truth, justice and healing. And we know you talked about um, my role, uh, Archbishop, in terms of uh, what I've done. But there are three women, no longer with us, that I wish to acknowledge and um, pay my deepest honour and respects to as well. And they are, of course, firstly Laurel Blow, for her very, very um, deep and abiding work that she did as one of our pioneers in Catholic education, in fact. And I remember back then I was a project officer working in DAA here, uh, here in Brisbane and uh, Laurel went off on her own and was doing all this grand stuff and never did we think that it would um, uh, come to what we have now, those very fine workers that are working in the um, in the ministry, in the Catholic education system and other systems for the um, uh, plight of justice for our people. I acknowledge you, uh, many of you in the room, and particularly, of course, Sonny Jean Phillips, um, our wonderful elder and matriarch in, uh, in, in Brisbane. And um, the other two women also I want to acknowledge are uh, uh, Joan Hendricks, who uh, <coughs> um, uh, was a, a magnificent teacher. She was an advocate, uh, a, great, uh, a great person for reconciliation, and we did a lot of work together, absolutely a lot of work together, both um, she and I. And of course, the, la uh, the last one is uh, Nerida White, Apo, um, Niapo who uh, was a very good friend of mine and uh, we shared many, um, uh, many times together just talking about how we could move stuff on for our people, not only for our people, but for the wider community and wider society because they needed to know the truth. And, uh, you know, these wonderful women, I think you've been very lucky in terms of your work and having them uh, within your... Um, within your family really, because they were really uh, great family members of, um, of the Catholic uh, institution and the church. Fierce, fierce advocates uh, would never take a backward step, but tell it like it really, really is. So um, here in Brisbane, I think we are blessed, absolutely blessed with uh, these fine people. Um, and David, I see you up there too as well, and, and others who have you know, shared the journey of reconciliation with me, particularly. I want to thank you from the, um, the bottom of my heart. Um, I must say, uh, when, uh, when Cynthia asked me, she gave me a couple of titles that I might use uh, around the truth-telling. And uh, at that stage, of course, I, um, I uh, have published two books this year, in February and April. I know that's crazy, but, you know, <laughs> um, I did it. But before that, in 1994, one of the first biographies to come out uh, was my mother's book, Auntie Rita. 
Now, now Auntie Rita, Rita was, uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, she was uh, rounded up uh, from Carnarvon Gorge and sent to Sherberg Aboriginal Mission. We'll talk about her and uh, the family history as we go through. Uh, my latest book is uh, Jack of Hearts, uh, co-authored with my sister, Nairi Jaro. And Nairi, uh, her family background, well, we were Anglican, we still are, I suppose, but she converted when she married my brother-in-law, Rod Jaro, in the um, 1970s. So she converted over to Catholicism. So they have that very much, very strongly through their line. And in fact, uh, all our boys went to Maris College Ashgrove, including my son, and uh, were very much schooled. And we probably can talk about the schooling system too, but it was, I, I can't fault it really. Of course, there were the elements of racism and taunting at school, but uh, by and large, they had a, a, a really good experience, unlike mine, um, at school. So um, I have another book called Sister Girl, uh, which I put out in uh, February. And Sister Girl is a revision of my uh, book uh, that I published in 1998, when nobody was doing this work particularly around um, a feminist analysis of what, uh, what society had brought to us. I want to go through now their stories. <coughs> so there's my mother from Carnarvon Gorge. I'm sure many of you have been there. And uh, very exquisite. Um, a bit like the Whitsundays. <laughs> and other places, Cairns and, and so forth. We all think our country is the most beautiful, don't we? You know, and, and uh, it really is. And I know that kids have been taken on uh, excursions out here from the Catholic uh, schooling system. So there's my beautiful country known for its rock art. Um, and Moss, Moss Garden, which is the right, is a woman's uh, birthing place. And up, up, up the top is the creeks and that run through it and the escarpment that um, comes over the top. Um, it's very, at the moment, it's very open to tourism, very uh, prone in the sense. Uh, and we don't know whether it's a good or a bad thing. Uh, the walking trails are very small and we have too much footage over that. It can really harm it. So uh, I've been involved in the last three years with my Uncle Fred Conway who was a ranger at Carnarvon Gorge, and we've been on a cultural heritage working group together with other Bidjara people and Gurungal people who have native title claim to uh, Carnarvon National Park. So um, we've been working on how we can absolutely preserve that pristine um, place that we have now without too much intention of travel. It makes it very difficult because sometimes my, my son has recently been appointed to Queensland Tourism and of course they're asking all the time how can we get into Carnarvon Gorge and film it and stuff and he's kind of holding back a bit now but, uh, but nevertheless and, and I guess that's the, that's the issue when we have our, our family, our, our people working within our sacred sites and so forth. So as I said my mother was rounded up here in the 1920s, she was born out there somewhere in a cave, is her oral history to us. And um, she was rounded up on the back of a cattle truck, sent to Sherberg Aboriginal Mission in the 1920s, in the days of the assimilation policy. And as Archbishop Mark has said, my story is also story, stories of other uh, Aboriginal people. So it's not unique. And it's not, um, by any stretch of the imagination, a, uh, a, it's a particular story, sure, but it's not, um, uh, it not, she wasn't the only one to experience this. So uh, coming through, um, 
Carnarvon Gorge and being um, sent uh, in, the, in the days of the assimilation policies under the Act, the Aborigines Protection and the Sale of Opium Act. There was the Aborigines Protection Act and various acts that keep that kept our people in places like this. I'll come back to that. This is my this is my family. This is my mother's. Um, uh, brothers and sister, sisters, 14 of them, um, and um, that was Barney, Claire, Margaret, Harry, Thelma, Rita, there's my mum in the blue, Violet, Ruby. Uh, my sister Marion was um, adopted, well she wasn't adopted, she was given to my mother and my grandparents because my mother went out to domestic service. Um, forcibly. Um, then we have Uncle Walter, Isabel, Lawrence, Oliver and Jimmy. Um, and the only one left now is Uncle Albert, second from the right down the bottom. And some of you might know Uncle Albert because he's done a lot of talks um, about culture and uh, education. Uh, he lived at Anala for many, many years. And uh, he now is in the Georgina Hostel for Aged and Disability at Morningside and uh, residing there with my brother John. So, um, <coughs> a little bit about the domestic servants. Marion was given to uh, my grandparents. I have to say, she. Um, she, we all had a difficulty with that because here was my mother being sent out at the age of 14 to care for white people and families, to look after their kids. Sometimes Aboriginal women domestic servants would wet nurse the kids as well. But here she was working out there on properties, usually cattle properties or in the... Um, dwellings of the authorities, perhaps the uh, police, um, policemen, um, the headmaster of schools, etc, etc. This wasn't an uncommon story, in fact it was the common story. So while she did this, she was unable to mother her own daughter. So there was a real, <coughs> excuse me, a real resentment on behalf of my dear sister Marion, or Mudu, as her nickname was, uh, she's passed now and, and uh, rest in peace, God bless. Uh, so you can imagine how the families were absolutely shattered and structured um, because of this uh, act of domestic uh, servants that our women had to undertake. Um, Mum was uh, Mum tells the story of when she was uh, 14, a trooper rode up to the house, my grandparents' house in Sherberg, knocked on the door, and they said, get Rita ready because she's getting on the train to Charleville tomorrow morning. You can imagine a 14-year-old girl. My Auntie Margaret, who's the lover underneath my granny Rosie, very fair, um, and they came in all shapes and sizes and kind of colours of the rainbow, the whole family. Um, but my dear Auntie Margaret was sent out at the age of eight to put down um, fence posts and to do the heavy manual labour. And of course in my book, Sister Girl, I do a whole exploration of the uh, injustice that happened to uh, my aunties, not only them, but women of that generation and how they were unfortunately um, uh, forced to work slave labour. Of course, what came after that was the issues around the stolen wages. And I see Ros Kidd's book up at the back um, talking about that uh, as well. The stolen wages still not to be resolved. Sure, there was pittance paid out by government, but really uh, not much compared to uh, what they did over 30 years.
And uh, I know that people like uh, Laurel Blow was a, uh, a domestic as well as her sisters. So that's them. Ironically, my father is an only child. <laughs> we have no relatives on his side anymore. Yeah, we don't know them. Uh, uh, there is some. Um, uh, there is some connection, but we 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 kind of lost that. So you know, you can imagine. Imagine when my father went to Sherberg to ask for my mother's hand in marriage. Uh, he couldn't have a drink with his prospective father-in-law, who liked a drink. But apparently, I heard they found something there. Um, uh, he was he was just bamboozled, I guess, by the overcrowding of the houses and how people had to get permission to move on and off the reserve. In fact, you know, mother had to get permission for him to come in and to meet um, uh, meet the foppers, so to speak, <laughs> the halts, of course. And I will use humour in my presentation. I always do because. When stuff gets so really hard and tense, you have to break it up with something that's, um, that's meaningful still, but not um, you know, showing away from the whole story. So here we go, and there it is. The fabulous uh, Sherberg Aboriginal Mission, Reserve, Concentration Camp. It was known by many things. And uh, um, many of us in Brisbane, I'd say, Many Aboriginal families come from Sherberg uh, because they came here in Brisbane in about the 1960s in search of employment, housing, education. But uh, and it's, we love this one because it says many tribes, one community, and it's true. There was about 36 tribes that were put onto Sherberg, and you would think that there would be a lot of fighting that went on in the early days. But I think people really knew that they had to survive and thrive. So therefore, out of that came one big community, the one community. And all of us who have Sherberg roots, uh, including um, some in the room, will know um, how that feels. We can't go back to Sherberg, you know, we visit places like the Ration Shed. And if you haven't visited the Ration Shed, you really must. This is the most informative historical place. And uh, the ladies there, um, the Malone girls, as I call them, really open up that to educate the wider public. So, um, and it's open, it's, it, it's an open place now. But of course, you will need to um, get in touch with the, uh, with the ration shed if you need to do visits. Historically, they will take you through the whole history of Sherberg and, and what happened. Right place. Okay, and that's my beautiful mother. Um, I hope that this will appear on the cover of her 30th anniversary uh, book of Auntie Rita in 2024. But lovely, the publishers have said to me they'd love it for next year, for Mother's Day. So nice. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay, right. <laughs> So that's our beautiful mother who passed away in uh, 1996, uh, age of 75, and uh, had so many stories and, and histories to tell us. Um, it was really fabulous writing her book because I had her there in physicality and she would, we would you know, uh, do the taping, put it down on her stories, preserve that. But of course, we would turn the story, we would turn the tape off in those days. We didn't have all the fancy stuff. We'd turn it off uh, when we'd had a fight, or as she said, um, fighting with our tongues. Uh, we'd turn it off for three weeks, and then we'd get back onto it. Yeah, come on now, let's, let's keep going. And she always said to me she wanted to see her book before she died. No pressure. <laughs> but we did get it out 14 months before she did pass. And uh, she was so proud of, uh, of, that, uh, of that book, and, and we still are. And it's the best-selling memoir uh, from Aboriginal Studies Press in Canberra to this day, which is great because it just keeps going and going. Um, my father, on the other hand, was a free man. 
It came from the little sugarcane country town of Eyre, North Queensland, one hour south of, uh, of Townsville. And some of you may have been there and seen the, um, um, the big carpet snake, that's our totem. Our totem on our mother's side is the emu. Um, but that sits very prominently in the park. So he was born what we call a free man, never imprisoned on a mission or a reserve. And how he escaped that, we believe, was because these two people, our grandfather, uh, John Henry Huggins II, and our grandmother, Fanny Huggins, were held in the greatest esteem from the local townsfolk uh, in air. They were um, never rounded up themselves. In fact, they lived the life of white fellas. They had a house, they had a car, they had um, uh, privileges in going to school. And you'll see my father there, third from the front, a uh, sorry, yeah, front row, third from the left, the only little black fellow in this class. And he was the only one that got education then. What was happening on the outskirts of town were town camps, where people were funneled into, from the bush, the town, uh, outskirts of air, put into town camps, and they were holding pens for uh, the removal of our people to missions and reserves. So from air, uh, there were people who were sent to, to Sherberg, obviously. Sherberg, um, Yarraba and Palm Island, mostly. We escaped that in some way, but our mother didn't. Our mother and our mother's father uh, didn't. So we, we believe, you know, it's where the, the, the fresh water met the salt water in terms of um, the, the, those two coming together. But, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a lot of these children actually stayed um, in touch with my father. They went to war with him, the men. And we had a beautiful book launch reunion three weeks ago on air. And we heard some stories. At the end there, we got people up to tell us their stories about uh, their grandfathers or their fathers knowing um, our father. And one really poignant story was um, a woman said, my father uh, followed your father over to um, the war. He was just 17 years of age. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, when it came to her father being married, he wanted my father to be his best man. And guess what? The grandfather, her grandfather, denied it. And he said, no, he will not be your best man. Um, I don't think I have to explain why. So, it's really nice though because those were things in the past and this woman now is um, very much going to stay in touch with my sister and I. In fact, my sister's going up to do the Delta yarns in September. Um, I have to be somewhere else, but uh, she has been made the guest of honour, which is, which is fantastic. Now here he is. Talk about history. There he is. You see those absolute beautiful legs on the left. <laughs> it's not fair men have great legs like that. <laughs> but that's my father. Uh, we have a photo of him, uh, which is in our book, of him uh, leading the patrol. So at one stage he must have, you know, been the captain for a day or something. But he would have been the first Aboriginal lifesaver in this country. Yep. And... Uh, and he is a great, um, a great rugby league player as well. And that's him, uh, second, uh, top, 
the second row on the left. Um, yeah, so great athlete, sportsman. Uh, we see, uh, my sister has three sons and I have one. We see all our boys in him um, around the athleticism, but also around the traits of dignity and honesty and uh, great men, great men that, that they've grown up to be. There he is again over there. It's really good. While we were researching the book, we got in touch with a fellow who's doing a, he's doing a, a history of air uh, rugby league team, and he was great. He gave us a lot of research, a lot of uh, information, and photos too, photos that we never had. So there he is. He played actually he played football before he went to war, and guess what? After after he came back in uh, forty eight. He, he captained a premiership side. Uh, it was a bit like the Foley Shield, but uh, it was amazing that he came back, uh, he came back skin and bone. Um, show you a photo soon, but then he regained his composure and in 1948, the, year, the war had ended in 1945, as you all know. Um, but uh, we didn't know that actually until we researched and found that, those photos that uh, he actually did um, uh, play rugby league when he came back and looked really, really healthy. Uh, and sorry about the quality of these photos, but he, that's him second from the right. There's a story in this and why we put it up. Um, while we were researching down at the War Memorial, um, Oh, we just lost hope that we're ever going to find a photo of him. We'd been there three days. And in the last half hour, I'm sure it was divine intervention. Of course it would have been. I flicked the, I flicked the page and I said, no, he looks straight. That's him. So this is probably the only photo we have of him uh, within his battalion. Yeah. And, oh, that's a bit blurry too, sorry, but you will see, you'll see the black fella second from the um, left there. That's our father, we believe. His profile is that of my sister and brother, or so. And when you see this clearly, um, it can't be anyone else. And he's in the, he's in the war camp here, the POW camp. And all the soldiers are white. Now, there were only 50, 50 Indigenous soldiers that went up the line on, on the Burma Railway. Um, and it's wonderful. I have, um, I have some stories. Um, and it was wonderful because people gave me the stories of some of their um, ancestors who went there as well in, uh, in Jack of Hearts. Yeah, but when we, when we found this, our hearts sank. We thought, oh well, that's how it was. Mm. And there they are, three very honourable people. My um, grandmother, she was a domestic. She was from uh, uh, Fort Constantine in um, Cloncurry, Mount Isa region. Uh, she wasn't under the Act either. So she was basically free. Certainly my grandfather on the, um, on the left was a, a free man too, but he'd fought in World War I. And when he came home, it was like all the soldiers from World War I were heroes. And uh, both my grandmother and my grandfather, when, father, when they died, they had obituaries, write-ups of them in the Townsville Bulletin highly unusual for Aboriginal folk at that time. Um, and my grandfather and my father had guards of honour um, when they died. From, uh, and I can tell you there weren't uh, any, or well, certainly there wouldn't have been anyone their First World War who was Indigenous that did that. Um, and for my father, um, there were just one or two. Uh, 
And of course, that's my dear mother. Always guided she had a 20 inch waist, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> I think I had that when I was about 10. <laughs> oh, my dear father. But by then he was uh, uh, 52, you know, so that's uh, 1952, that was their wedding day. Um, and our beautiful little family home here in uh, Soper Street here. That's on the corner of uh, Beach Road and, um, and uh, Soper Street. And he would bicycle, he would bicycle all the way um, for his life-saving um, exercise and stuff. He'd, he'd go down there on his bike and of course he had his bike for his, his duties, which were at the post office, we'll come back to that. But here we are, and Mum used to dress us in 20s, and when we did the launch in air three weeks ago, we dressed as 20s as well, <laughs> but different colours. <laughs> and um, uh, that's Nari, my sister on the right. Uh, of course, you know who that is on the left, and little Johnny, who was, who was uh, four months old when our father died. And that's our big sister, Gloria. And Gloria... Um, Unfortunately, she died in her 20s uh, in a car accident. And my mother, well, my father adopted her as well, but he had three healthy children, three healthy children when he came back from the war. We don't know how he did that. Oh, and here we go to me. Um, like my father, I'm the only black kid in the photo here, I know that there were one or two that wagged it that day. <laughs> and I said, how come, you know, I get, um, you fellas should have been here. I used to growl them all the time and be very bossy about um, where our kids were. Um, and some of you will know my dear sister, Charmaine Tatton. <laughs> and Charmaine used to say to me, you were, you were, you were the one uh, so academic, so you'd, Never wanted to miss school, you know, one time. But um, uh, this was later when we went to high school, but I still carried that through in the way. And this teacher was um, uh, one of those brilliant teachers. She taught us about the environment back then, you know. She was a greenie. Um, and she um, really uh, had a lot, of, um, a lot of hope for Aboriginal uh, people and this was 19. Can you see that? 1967, 68, 66. Right? <laughs> By then, I wasn't even a citizen of my own country. I was 11 years of age. But she said, someday, Aboriginal people are going to have rights, um, which was good. So that was a, um, a photo taken back then. And there were some great teachers. You know, I said to a 300 teachers last week at the state library. We always remember the ones that we had, the good and the bad teachers, don't we? You know? And she was, by gee, she was fantastic. I stayed in touch with her up until 10 years ago. She's uh, quite old now. Um, but some of the teachers in the audience actually knew her. Yeah. And her other claim to fame was that uh, we're a gun softball team, right? <laughs> Used to beat all of with his own champions. <laughs> And one day we're going from Inala to Corinda. Uh, that's Serviston State School in Inala. Uh, and she, f she fitted, couldn't do it now, she fitted 10 girls in that mini minor of hers. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. We would all get hooked or something. But yeah, great times I had with her. I had terrible teachers too, as we all have. Especially one who told me I was Aboriginal and Aboriginal people have got no brains, so therefore you can't do senior. Anyway, that's another story. Oh, that's me and um, my dear son, my beautiful son, John. John Henry Huggins V. Um, and I have to scide up about education because education, of course, has been my salvation and the salvation of others. Um, the lovely... Um, hey, he's not even in there. Oh, yes, he is. Lovely man in the middle is my nephew, Nairi's son, Nathan Jaro, standing next to his wife, Ali. 
Uh, he is the first, the first Indigenous judge in Queensland. Four years ago he was that. We now have a Supreme Court judge, of course, uh, Lincoln Crowley. Um, and of course, Tony McAvoy, who also was our first QC, our first silk in 2016. He comes from Anala as well. So, um, and we're hoping through Auntie Jean to have a, a celebration for them uh, at some time to say how, how really proud we are in terms of um, th their education uh, and so forth. Now, okay. So I guess just wanted to talk about a little bit about writing because through writing um, we are truth tellers. We do the truth telling that way. We do the truth telling through our art. And there's some beautiful art pieces at the back there too that tell story, that tell, uh, um, uh, that tell you know, a whole range of things. Uh, did anybody see the Sunshine Club? That was, uh, that was the Sunshine Club which was uh, at QPAC and it was a story of uh, when an Aboriginal man came back from war and the sort of um, treatment that, that he got. I mean, he could not, he could not go into um, hotels or clubs. That was the, our father was the exception actually, because that was the rule back then. When they came back, they were second class citizens. Still nobody wanted to know them. But our father was quite the exception. He would go to the RSL for a, a beer or two uh, he was allowed into hotels. People knew him as a, a local uh, identity. And he did not experience the kind of treatment that our other Aboriginal soldiers got. So I made it very, it was very, very important for me to put into uh, uh, his book the treatment that other Aboriginal soldiers uh, received when they came back from, um, uh, from war. A bit like that, you know, with the Vietnam vets and so forth. Oh, well, it's very different, but, um, you know, when, when they do service for country and then are scorned uh, by it. Now, in terms of doing the book in 94 for Mother, um, I had her in physicality and, as I said, the tapes went on and off, depending on our moods of the day. Uh, so I had her with me, which was great. So she and I did that one. The second one, of course, was relying on memory. And the best primary resource material that we ever had was our mother, who would speak about our father every single day. She never let us forget him. He lived with us. He lived, he lived in the curtains. He lived under the bed. You know, he lived in the kitchen. He was everywhere. And our mother um, never remarried. She was a war widow all her life. She said she could never find a man to match uh, our father. Of course, she had many admirers and uh, and, and, boy, and boyfriends, but um, never really took you know the full leap to uh, uh, to find another uh, kindred spirit or soul. Um, Jack of Hearts is. Um, is I think um, putting forward some of the war narratives, um, the, more, the, the, the uh, war stories, the service of our, of our men and our women. And we know people like Ujuru served as well, and other um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have served um, in uh, every conflict. Our people have served in every conflict that we have had in the history of our country. This was the second biography of, um, of someone who had uh, been on the uh, Thai Burma Railway. Uh, the other one was Mr John Hill from uh, West Australia who wrote uh, his little uh, book many, many years ago. So we're really very proud of um, Father's book. And of course, Sister Girl, I call these three the trilogy, you know, there's a the kind of trilogy type thing. Um, <coughs> And that's uh, 40 years of reflections on, on uh, what I know as, what we know as titterism, which is like Alice Walker framed the term womanism. Well, I framed the term titterism, like it's our feminism. 
really. Um, identity and reconciliation, because I thought I had lots to say about reconciliation in our country and still do. So, um, you know, I've rolled those out because really that's my truth telling and the truth telling that I can share with you, that I'm, I am willing and able to. But there's been a resurgence of Aboriginal arts in our country for the past five years, I reckon, where um, in my day, you could count the writers on one hand. Now there are hundreds and hundreds. Poets, essayists, non-fiction, fiction writers. So uh, that gives me great heart. And in September, I'm the patron of the First Nations um, Aboriginal Writers Network. And we're having a big summit in um, September in uh, Adelaide to encourage more writers to do, um, to do the stories uh, themselves. I'm very proud that um, uh, they've asked me to come along and, and do a keynote for them too. Um, so through our arts, uh, through our arts, uh, they, are, they are the vessels by which we are able to um, impart uh, some wonderful uh, messages, ideas, for you to come along with us, perhaps for you not to want to delve into it, but that's, you know, that's, uh, th that's up to you. I think probably I'm talking to the converted here, um, here in person and online. We know how important those stories are and those messages to get it out. I have to tell you that when I published um, Sister Girl uh, in 1998, I had black hair then, like many of us have. <laughs> but uh, I sold more Sister Girls this time in two months than I had ever sold in 24 years of the other sister girl with black hair. <laughs> now, what is that saying to us people? <laughs> you know, it wasn't about my hairdo, I think. But... Wisdom. Wisdom, yes, it's a wisdom now. Thank you very much, and I feel that. I really feel I'm sort of you know, coming into that wisdom and that eldership that I uh, have so longed for all my life. I love getting older, apart from my health issues. But uh, I think it is uh, a place where we all grow. We grow into this uh, incredible spiritual way too, um, that, that, that we do that. But um, yeah, so I think that's probably uh, right on the bell of um, finishing up here now. Cynthia, thank you, I think. That's it, yeah, no more, no more. So thank you for listening to my story. I hope it's um, been beneficial, thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Fascinating. I couldn't help but think of a, a quote of, of Karen Blixen, who wrote Out of Africa, as I listened to Jackie. <clears throat> Karen Blixen wrote at one point, any pain or sorrow is bearable if you can tell a story about it. And Jackie Huggins is many things, but I suspect at the heart of them all, Jackie, you are a storyteller. And that's all about pain and sorrow. It is bearable. It's never really comprehensible, but bearable is different. And I think to a very Wiesel writing his extraordinary book called Night about his time in Auschwitz. And again, he was Jewish and obeyed the deepest impulses of the Bible. Because the Bible, too, is one great story to try and make sense of pain and sorrow. The Bible is the saddest book of all, seen from one angle, but it is the most jubilant book of all because it goes to the heart of sorrow, tells a story, and finds cause for joy. And I think Jackie is doing something similar, <coughs> but perhaps even unconsciously. But there's something profoundly biblical about the truth-telling that Jackie Huggins and others uh, are undertaking. And it is crucial for us all. Now, I wonder, is there any question or reflection that anyone would like to offer? 
Yes. yes. If you could say who you are and then... <coughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, Dr. Huggins, I've spent a bit of time in Latin America and sort of aware that there's a, a church that currently has a Latin American Pope. Uh, we have a culture war going on for our church. And we're trying to find a way path forward, pathway forward, in which we can have adult conversations. And I think the problems that the recent plenary council gave evidence to some of that. Uh, last week, that Pope visited Canada, and one of the calls of First Nations people in Canada was for at least a repudiation, if not a revocation, of the papal bulls of 1455 and 1493 relating to the doctrine of discovery and the legal basis of terribleness. What advice do you have for us as Catholic Church in regard? That didn't happen for the Pope. No, thank you. And, and um, look, thank you for that, uh, for that question because I think uh, what the Pope did was fantastic. Uh, we got ours 20 years ago. Um, uh, and the, uh, uh, but also uh, native title Mabo decision dismantled terra nullius in terms of the doctrine that said we did not own this country, somebody else did, British law had it. Um, the doctrine of discovery, I think is a process, I think that is so like terra nullius to, to be dismantled and to be put right. Um, I know that Native Americans have had this fight for, for many, many years, and I would hope someday, and, and I'm, I'm not sure that it's up to the Pope to do this. I think it's up to the governments to look at the doctrine. Uh, that's their responsibility to get rid of it. Yes, and the churches. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, well the Pope, but I think the initial call has to come from governments. Yeah. And then we follow through. In terms of reconciliation, the faith groups, back in my day, 30 years ago, when we, when we were doing the Council for Reconciliation, were one of our strongest supporters. Just, just absolutely incredible, you know? Um, but, uh, and, and we could, you know, walk that path together, and I still think we can, because, you know, there are so many powerful, uh, you know, institutions around now, and powerful people like our archbishops and uh, bishops uh, and your hierarchy that are, are coming along with us. So I'd hope to see a revival of that uh, as well. But, um, yeah, and while I've got the mic in terms of our treaty, and I didn't even mention that, our treaties here for Queensland is that we need your support as well once this stuff gets rolled out, you know, because we know the responsibility of churches putting our people on missions and so forth. Uh, the indoctrination of that has to be part of that very strong truth-telling as well. And the truth-telling, did you all see Compass? Do you watch Compass? Yeah, Mike Brown, dear friend of mine, and his wife Jean, um, advocates of reconciliation with Lowitcher O'Donoghue many, many years ago. If you haven't seen it, I think it's repeated on, or I view it, but uh, repeated on the 7th of August. And he, he had been involved in a massacre. Oh, well, he, his family had been involved in massacre of Aboriginal people and then the reprisals happened and then all this stuff. See, that's the kind of thing I think we need to be doing in terms of our truth-telling. And when we did our consultations, our people said to us, we want truth-telling first, we want truth-telling up there, and we want uh, a statement that says we have never ceded sovereignty of our country, which we never have. You know, and that's the truth too. But there are so many truths that we need to talk about, express, and um, outline. You know, in, in the truth-telling process that we're going to have in this state in the next uh, five years, uh, because we got a huge investment, a huge investment from the state government, not last budget, but the budget before, $300 million, folks, to get the ball rolling on treaty, and $45 million there to do a treaty uh, uh, sorry, to do a truth-telling mechanism, to set up a commission 
that's going to bring all that stuff out. And I don't think uh, that's a bad thing. And in fact, I really welcome that. But I know the churches near need to play a huge role in that, in bringing that, um, you know, that so those sources of information out. And whether it's, you know, debunking our, 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 our horrible acts that we used to have before and um, the myths about us, well, thank goodness, you know, people know now that we are the oldest living culture on the planet, 65,000 years of age. You can't beat that. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Now, are there any other questions or... Yes, we have another. Dr. Okay, that is wonderful. Thank you. If all goes well over the next few years, we might have a First Nations voice to our federal parliament. I'm wondering what your hopes are for what might be possible with that voice. Mm. Well, uh, I have been uh, probably involved in federal politics most of my life now through uh, a whole range of things including um, a body we had as the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, of which I co-chaired, of which the government um, got rid of us, um, uh, uh, starved us of funding because we dare criticise things like the cashless debit card, for goodness sake. Other things, uh, you know, incarceration rates, um, child protection, you name it. So we went across the whole... Um, the whole country in terms of uh, naming the wrongs of our people. So really, essentially for us, it was set up by Aboriginal people, had an ethics committee, it was post-ATSIC, uh, it was gender representation. You would always have a, a, a female and a male co-chair, but all through these three chambers that we had. So it was uh, set in stone, but it wasn't good enough. and. Uh, uh, this, I believe, uh, was the uh, model for The Voice. But, uh, and it has never been mentioned in, you know, sort of, uh, when people talk about it, they just talk about ATSIC. And I think, well, hang on, we had, we had the National Congress there for 10 years as a process, which was our institution. So uh, this one now, um, um, uh, very important, of course. And come the referendum, people, we're going to have everyone out. You know, we will have the bigots and the racists and people who've never met an Aboriginal person come to you with a story and say, this is how they are or this is how they act. Please don't believe them, you know. And I know that you wouldn't. But um, it's going to be, it will be quite ugly. It, it will be quite ugly, uh, starting already, you know, uh, I listen to talk back radio, and no, I shouldn't, but I like to know what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> and, uh, and I think I want to answer that, and you, know, you can't pull the car up. And, you know. But, you know, it, it's starting now to fester. Um, but you know what? I think we are in a very different position than we were 30 years ago running this stuff. Uh, and I think there is, a, there is a great groundswell of support. The danger is, the absolute danger is, the question and the model. And to bring people along with that. And what's in it, you know? What's in the voice? How old don't know? You know? What's it going to look like? Um, and people say, oh, well, we've done all that. The details in the 250-page report, go and read that on the website. How yeah, mob ain't going to do that. And uh, most of your mob won't do it either, you know? So really, what happened, needs to happen now, I think, is the government needs to distill the model and what the voice is. They need to distill it down in layman terms for all of us, for all of us to really understand and um, come to grips with it. Because, as we say, who wants to vote on a question that we don't even know what the content is? You know, and I'm, I'm sort of in that camp and I know that I... Probably, uh, you know, my people want me to be a lot more optimistic around that, but I can't be because um, I know what's out there. And I know that uh, if we don't explain this to people, to all people, then we're never going to get too far, you know? I mean, it's a great thing around the symbolism and, and the practical nature of, uh, of the voice. But um, 
Uh, being enshrined in the constitution is a great thing. You, you can't, they cannot get rid of you like ATSIC in the National Congress is firmly implanted. And look, folks, look at close the gap statistics. You know, it's going to take about 300 years at this rate to close that gap. We only have four working for us out of the 17 indicators. We need something now as a catalyst that can stop that. And I do believe if the voice gets up, works with government, provides structural reform in systems such as child protection, incarceration, um, homelessness, all those areas where we suffer greatly, which is much, uh, much of the society, then that will make a difference. We, we've got to try something new. This is our golden opportunity. If we miss this, bye bye. You know, I'm certainly not going to be around to see the next referendum where they might take it up for our people. But this is a, a great opportunity, and please, you know, tell your people to vote yes once we know what it's what it's about. Thank you. We have another voice. Auntie Dr. Jackie, thank you so much for well, sharing thanks. your family stories. I can't wait to read the trilogy. Um, I would, and I think you started talking about it now, but I'd love to hear your wisdom about how we, as you know, you talk about probably all children are converted. How was our responsibility and any wisdom from you about how do we reach that divide in this polarised context that we're sitting in? Because the message needs to be heard by all, and it's very, we tend to hang out with those who are similar, like minded. But what's your wisdom for us to take responsibility to be in the terms of that story? Yeah, well, go to those places that are really hard, you know? Go to um, uh, those places there that we, uh, and people that we don't, uh, that don't serve us well or have never acknowledged our presence here. Um, you know, I was very um, dismayed about the Welcome to Country and Pauline Hanson walked out. Now, there are going to be Pauline Hansons in our community that we can never shift. We will never shift them. But we can try. We can try probably not with her, but we could probably try with, with others that kind of are still on the fence a bit, you know? Um, so I just say, just please go out, uh, talk to people, educate them, your families, your communities, the people that you know. And you will have hard discussions in those places as well. Like in, on the Talkback Radio, this woman said, no, I don't want to give them any more entitlements. I'm thinking, well, what entitlements are they really, you know? So the entitlement that we are still going to die 10 years younger, that before the age of 40, we will get one or two chronic diseases, or is it because we, we are sick and tired of going to funerals every single week, and that we are sick and tired of our people being put into um, jails and prisons? They don't need to be there, particularly Aboriginal women, who are the fastest growing prison population, not only in Australia, but the world, the world people, you know. That is a disgrace. We need to do better. This is not our country if we, if we can't help the most vulnerable. And it is our mob, you know, and every, every statistics, statistic that you even wish to look at, you know. We're Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people, down the bottom, you know. So we all need to work harder within ourselves personally um, and please, do read, do go to shows, do buy beautiful Aboriginal arts and craft. The jewellery down there is from a, a wonderful Sherberg um, sister girl of mine. That's her daughter, Monique. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Aunty Jean, of course, up there for Sherberg and Lani as well. Um, so uh, support us as artists and people who are really, you know, trying to tell the truth. Videos, documentaries, look at those shows, educate yourself. That's the only um, thing I, I, I say to people all the time that say to me, well, what can I do? What can I do? You know your power. If you are a teacher, you teach the good stuff. If you're an employer of any sort, go and employ a few blackfellas. They won't bite you. 
they would be grateful for a job. Oh, just as my father was grateful for a job when he came back from the war, the PMG gave him a job in 1946. Now, you know the war ended in 45. 1946, he got a job working in the post office. Had to come down here all the time to Green Slopes Military Hospital uh, for his um, war injuries uh, and, and his health. But giving a person a job is the first start. It empowers them, it gives them confidence, it gives them identity, it gives them a purpose. So I've said to businessmen and women when I've spoken to them, just give them a job, give them a try, and uh, they won't disappoint you. And don't employ us by one. You need a couple there to um, to be buddies for each other because you know that can go um, go the other way as well. So yeah, educate, 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 please, people. Thank you. <laughs> I think we'll have to call it to a point of rest, if not conclusion. Uh, but I do so with um, profound thanks to you, Jackie, um, <clears throat> for being um, willing to say yes and, and sharing so fascinatingly. And <clears throat> I'm recovering from COVID. Fascinatingly <laughs> and generally. <laughs> No, I, I assure you I'm negative, but I'm not completely over it. But for sharing so fascinatingly and generously, um, thank you, of your water. I pass back to Cynthia Rowan, who will conclude the morning. But thanks very much to Jackie Rowan. On behalf of, and on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Dr. Jackie Huggins, and especially for these beautiful flowers from the staff at ACU, the uh, First Nations Engagement Unit. Just a few things. Uh, we're going to have um, morning tea shortly. Um, if someone could lift the blinds so we could see the beautiful city of Brisbane. Um, I just wanted to say that um, as part of the Archdiocese of Brisbane's um, Reconciliation Action Plan, the Lowell Blow series is part of that and the Archbishop chairs all of the Lowell Blow speeches. Uh, has the number one advocate for our Reconciliation Action Plan, so Archbishop Mark Thank you once again. Uh, I'll also like to acknowledge the work from um, Evangelisation um, Brisbane staff. Uh, firstly, my um, line manager and associate director, Eric Robertson, who kindly was running the microphone today. Thank you, Eric. Emma Plant is the one that's doing the communications and sending out all the information in relation to the Laurel Blow speaker series. And she actually did these flyers that you would have found on the seat for the next um, Laurel Blow speaker series. And as, as you would see, this year's theme is truth telling. So the theme for this year was decided in November last year by pilot parishes um, that were implementing the Reconciliation Action Plan. It was from those parishioners that spoke very clearly that before we do anything, we need to do truth telling first. So that's why we've got the theme this year. So on this flyer, there's a little uh, QR code. That's so that you could be registered interest for attending. Uh, but you're not registered to attend, it's your interest to attend. So uh, that is for the Truth Telling the Foundation for Reconciliation. And then there's a paid event which is called the Australian Blanket Exercise. And it's a Truth Telling activity, it's $50 and that's on a separate sheet. So that's going to be on the 6th of October here at ACU but in another building. 
So you have the opportunity to, to explore ACU a bit more. It's going to be in the John Paul II building, which is over that way somewhere, I think. <laughs> I've probably given you the wrong direction, but anyway, you'll get a map. The other helpers that we've had uh, besides Emma is Monica. Um, that's back up the back. She's helped as well. And we've got Lorraine and Lisa. So I don't know where they're hiding. Um, and of course, from the ACU staff, I wish to acknowledge in particular Fiona um, under Jane's leadership that she's worked in partnership. But in particular, um, Australian Catholic University through the um, First Nations Engagement Unit has sponsored the Lowell Blow Speaker Series this year. So both the events are here at ACU campus and we both have reconciliation action plans. Um, so we're meeting our commitment to work together. So thank you very much, Jane. So I'll invite everyone to, uh, you could turn your phones back on if you like, and we can break for morning tea. Thank you all very much. Just, just before we do break for morning tea, um, Cynthia Rowan can't thank herself, but I can. <laughs> Cynthia is retiring at the end of this year from her unique work with the Bank of Relations in Brisbane. And she's been a driving force in so, so many ways, including the Laurel Flow of the Speaker Series. So Cynthia, I just want to say very publicly thank you for everything you have contributed. It's been a unique contribution and gift. You are going to be much missed, probably irreplaceable, but I thank you very much, not only for what you've done to prepare for this morning, but for everything you have done to help us along the path of reconciliation. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah.